Thank you very much. I will carefully now try to share my screen, share yeah. sound, optimize for video clip like that. So thank you very much for inviting me to this, this uh, kind of presentation about underwater noise. I, already been introduced, but I could also add to that, that I've been working with underwater sound and noise for more than now 15 years, I would say. And, and this kind of this area of underwater noise, I would say underwater sound started earlier, but underwater noise started, took off some 20 years ago and really sparked a lot of interest 10 years ago, I would say. And partly the interest raised due to the uh, European Union, including underwater noise in one of the descriptors, uh, that is something that has to be managed and regulated by the managers in the European Union. Uh, and it has been a long journey, but I've been involved in different kinds of studies and groups along the way. And today I'm sitting as a chair in, in TG Noise, as we call it, and I, I will at the end mention a little bit about the work there. Let's see. So I will start to, uh, to present, I try to make you understand that, that uh, noise, and when I talk about noise, that is something that you don't want to have in the ocean. When I try to talk about sound, that's something that is naturally there. So now, when I talk about noise now, I would like to start presenting some results that, that really strongly suggests that noise is not good in the underwater environment. And from there, I will go to what is hearing when it comes to, to animals, aquatic animals. And from hearing, I will take it up in a little bit broader scale. What, what does animal hear? What is their their way of listening in, in, in the environment. And from there, then we, I introduce some anthropogenic sources. And the two most common ones, at least in the European waters, uh, and how they impact uh, the underwater life. And then the ne ne next step is to, to talk about how to manage these things and a little bit what's happening in the European Union. So I would like to start to show you this one. This was actually an article in Science uh, this year uh, by a, a, a number of people. And it's, uh, it's actually what, to make a long article short, it actually say that we have to stop discussing if underwater noise is a problem. We know now that it is a problem. And uh, this is a very important article because it was signed, so to say, by very many people. And, and, and it also is used now as kind of a stepping stone that we, we it's let, we, we're not going to talk anymore about if. It, we know it is, and we have to start working on how to regulate it and how to, how to decrease uh, noise levels in the ocean. Uh, there are, of course, other studies like Gomez et al., which is very important for the Mediterranean community, and are taking this uh, this figure from the uh, Gomez et al's paper, which shows that what kind of effects uh, do we really regard when it comes to underwater noise. And there are different ways of doing this, but, uh, but usually what we talk about is these zones, as you see in the top of the, of the figure, and, and zone one is closer to the animal, zone two is far away, and zone three is even further, far further away. And then you have different sound sources and they do inflict different kinds of impacts. And so if you are on the bottom part of the y-axis, uh, we have less impact. And if you are in the upper part, we have, have actually a higher impact. If you go from smaller impact, we see that we have stress response. Uh, that is the animal gets stressed. This is something, a noise level that they are not accustomed with. Uh, then if you go up, we have masking, that is that they can't communicate anymore. And in the last year, masking has been broadened up in the way that it masks, you're not communicating, you are, you are listening to your natural 
ambient sound and then you can't hear the ambient sound because there are anthropogenic noise so you're masking the natural noise it's a little bit like if you stand in a forest and then the the the, the leaves the, the the sound from the leaves and from the birds is is natural but if there's a car nearby it's, it's it will mask the the sound from the birds and then you come up to more more severe responses and the, that is behavioral response and that is that the animal actually for some uh, some kind of noise levels start to behave in a certain way and one way which we, we, we are looking at uh, quite closely in the community is that they are actually displaced. That means that they cannot be in an area, so they are moving away from that. And that can be, of course, permanent displacement. It can also be partial displacement. But in principle, they are, they are, not, they are expelled from the natural habitat or even moved out from the natural habitat, which is, of course, not good. And then it comes into injuries in the top pair. And uh, PTS is permanent threshold, uh, threshold changes and, and TTS is temporal. Uh, temporal, that is that uh, if you have been in a bar and the noise is a little bit loud and you come out, you can, you're, you're, you can have a temporal uh, loss of hearing, but it usually comes back after one, one day. But have a PTS that is for, so, so to say uh, all the time, you can't get it back. And of course, these things happen on different distances from the sources. So PTS and TTS is just occurring very near to the sound sources, uh, while behavior response, for example, can actually appear quite far away, depending on the species. So these are, these are what we are talking about when it comes to adverse effects on animals. Uh, I, I will dwell a little bit on, upon that later, but here is a, an interesting result from Gomez et al. And I don't ask you to really understand that, but if you look at the B figure, the, the figure of the panel B here, upper right part, it is for mid frequency toothed cetaceans. And that means that the, the, the frequency, frequency range is from 100 hertz up to 100 kilohertz. Uh, what we're talking about, and they are exposed to continuous sound, and there are 49 studies that, uh, that this paper, Gomez et al., has summarized. And what they see now is three different curves here. One is yellow, one is blue, and I think one is green there. And uh, what they say on the x-axis is that they have a high moderate or low behavioral, behavioral change, depending on the y-axis, which is the received levels of sound. Uh, and what in principle, what you have to understand that now is that somewhere around, one, somewhere around 110 dB, it's actually all these three behavioral reactions happens at about at the same times. So you can't distinguish that high, uh, behavioral uh, reactions happens after low. They, 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 all these 49 studies uh, summarized uh, indicate that you have all of these reactions, at, not at the same time, but to different animals happens at 110 dB. And one, of course, can, can talk about what is the severity score and, and uh, what kind of, how can you bunch together these different kind of animals. But it's a good paper, at least trying to summarize the, the, the status on mammals today. This is actually uh, limited to mammals. So, so I, what I want to show you with this is that there is studies actually which pinpoint that at a certain sound level something happens uh, with the mammals so that we cannot go around today another very interesting article it's maybe a little bit on, on, on a peripheral for us in the baltic but it at least shows that the, there is much more complex complex kind of, of reactions from animals and this is about swimming coral larvae and if you look at the lower left figure, what they did on a reef, flat reef, is was they had plastic tubes mounted above the seabed, and they were insonifying them with coral sound, natural coral sound. So some of these 
they had several of these uh, tubes and some of them were insonified with coral reef sound and some was not. And they, there was a st st statistical significant increase of settling of larvae on the tubes that were insonified with coral reef sound. This implies that the larvae, they are listening somehow. I, I wouldn't say listening, but hearing at least this coral reef uh, sound. Um, they, they somehow react on that and settle because that's how coral reefs grow. If you settle in the sand, you won't grow. You have to uh, settle on the coral reef to be successful. So even larvae are sensitive to sound in, 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 in a way. And that's what I wanted also to, to introduce with this uh, study is that, that it's not just about grown up mammals or grown up fish. It it, it, sound and noise is about what kind of life stage uh, is the animal in? What is the animal at this season doing? It's very different when they are mating from when they are not mating. It's different when they are hunting if they're not hunting. And so, so one has to be a little bit careful also with 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 the with the with, the, with the sound noise. Uh, one level can can inflict a, uh, can induce an impact in a certain life stage, but not in other life stages. Uh, a little bit jumping back and forth, but uh, now we're talking about fish. Uh, and uh, uh, Richard Fay is, is kind of a pretty famous researcher when it comes to fish. In 2009, he, he uh, uh, published this paper. And it is interesting paper because he's using a little bit poetic uh, statements. And he says that, uh, sound uh, in air is based on communication, that is vocalization. What is the hearing of a goldfinch? It is a mystery. That was his states in it. And uh, it, what he means with mystery here is that that communication was started very uh, like hundred years ago when it comes to 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 uh, to land animals, and especially a lot have been done on birds. And then always the focus is on the transmitter, which is then the, the, the bird which is sending a message, the bird that is vocalizing. And then the, the vocalizing is done by somebody transmitting and somebody receiving. But if you have a fish in a laboratory and you put down a microphone, which is called hydrophone when it comes to water, it's, they don't talk. They don't give any, no, any sound, they don't vocalize usually. So the question came up, but then we have to, if we look at, at birds and animals on land, the whole idea of vocalizing is that you transmit something, you are sending something, some kind of interesting information to not, some other, other uh, animal that you would like to scare off or, or, or in, in, when it comes to birds, it's both scaring off and to attract, especially in spring. So we did this experiment that he trained a goldfish and he trained it to be uh, insonified with uh, noise. And noise is, so to his mathematical, doesn't have any information. It's uh, no information in noise. But so if you're sitting in a room and there is pure noise, it's, it's like putting on an old TV and you can just hear this sparkling like that. But immediately, if you put a plate behind you, the noise has information in it. It's, it is a bit of wonder actually that that happens, but it mathematically it can be shown that, that it's not white noise anymore. You can actually hear that it's a plate behind you. And this is what he, uh, did with the, with the goldfish. He, he trained it to be able to, to react on noise and we put a plate behind it. He could see that the goldfish reacted and the goldfish mediated that by, by doing a, a certain kind of, of movement in, in, in the laboratory. And that was somehow a, a starting point that yes, the goldfish is using it. And if you look in, in the lower left point, you have this, this fish there which is not a goldfish, but it actually belongs to the goldfish family. And this is very, very important for fish because when 
when the predator, like a pike, uh, sneaks up, they can hear it. So very many fish, at least, they use uh, sound to, to better understand the environment. And, and if you've been diving, then most of us has been doing in the Baltic Sea, and immediately when you when you go down to one two meters, there is hardly any use of ice anymore, especially not at five and ten meters. So, the the way that very fish and other species in the Baltic Sea really understands the environment is by using acoustics. Acoustics is very important for the animals, and then we come. I'm just going to, yes, I'm going to now talk a little bit about, about, uh, about what is hearing, what, how do we hear. Now we know it's important for them and we know that the studies shown that you can actually, uh, it's harmful with very high levels. So let's start with tooth whales because we have the harbour porpoises in the Baltic Sea, but it's, it's mainly for all whales the same kind of story when it comes to, to, to hearing. And we know that when it comes to waves that they're both producing sound and they are also listening to sound. And producing sound they do by using the nose, so to say, as you see in the upper part there. So they are vibrating the nose and then they have, many of them have a melon. And the melon is this, this red area here. And that is a kind of a soft tissue that they can form and that by forming it, they can also, what we call in acoustics, beam forming the, the transmitted sound. So they can actually, a little bit like a flash lamp that you, you, can, you, can, you can have it more focused or less focused, let's say. And this is what they can do with, with, the, with the transmitted sound. So it's, the sound goes out. In some cases, it's reflected in coming back. And then it's pretty high frequencies usually, so they had to, to somehow transmit it to the air. And whales doesn't have openings, air opening. And usually what they state on the whales is that they can't hear airs because they are so slim and so specialized in swimming. That I think is, is partly true, but that is what is stated. So the air is inside the body behind the cheekbone. And this is the air here. So they help somehow to get the sound from the outside into the air. And what they are doing is that they have the, the lower cheek point when it comes to dolphins that leads, uh, propagates the sound from the outside into the air. And then it, the cheekbone vibrates and precisely like the human ear, it, it uh, initiates a movement in the air and they can hear it. When it comes to, to Balean whales, it, it is usually the upper cheek that is used to lead the, 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 the propagate the sound into the air. Fish is a little bit diff different. Uh, fish doesn't hear, I would say in general, fish doesn't hear uh, pressure variations. Humans, we do hear pressure variations because the pressure from a source makes the drum in our ear vibrate and that brings into the inner part of the air a pressure difference that we can hear. Uh, they don't have any drum, uh, in general, the, the fish. So what happens is that actually they have otolith organs, and that is what I'm pointing here. Inside their air, they have small stones, which are heavier uh, than both the air and the body. Uh, and these stones, they are like, like if you, if you have an egg in your hand uh, and then you vibrate your, your hand, the egg will not move in, in, in face with your hand. It will be a bit lacking. So there will be a difference uh, between the egg and your hand. And then they have this hair below the stone that can actually sense the motion, the relative motion between your hand and the egg. In, this, in the fish case, it's between the fish and, and the stone. So, so what happens when the sound comes, hits the, the fish, is that the fish will move with the sound, but the stone will, will not move in the same phase as the fish, and they can sense the, the, the sound. And actually what happens is that they can sense what direction the sound comes from. Because if you vibrate your hand 
back and forth or left or right or up and down, that will induce different kinds of reaction in, in the hair cells. So it's just the part, so what we call that is that they are sensitive to particle motion. However, uh, the fish is, is, is more developed than that because some of the fish has also been able by evolution to connect their swim bladder to this stone. So when the sound uh, hits the fish, the swim bladder will start to, to vibrate in exactly the same ways as the drum of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of our ears. And this vibration will push on this uh, air and make the, these stones uh, vibrate. So they can, some fish can, can hear both pressure variation and particle motion. So for example, cod they, and, and herring, they can hear both pressure and particle motion. But uh, macrella, for example, and flatfish living on the seabed cannot. And also eel cannot hear pressure variation. They have a swim bladder, but it's so far away from the hearing organ. So there's no connection between the swim bladder and, uh, and the otolith organ in this case. So it's very different. Uh, fish are very different. And those who have this pressure sensitivity, they can hear up to one kilohertz. And the fish that doesn't have it and just particle motion, they can hear up to some hundred hertz in frequency. So that is also one big difference. And this picture, I hope you can see it, shows the difference between particle motion. So the red arrow shows the particle motion and the black arrow shows how a pressure variation uh, propagates in, in, in water. And this is also how it looks in, like in air and in water, that if you have a sound, there is all, some propagating, it's always both particle motion and wave motion at the same time. And by the technology that we are using uh, for, for recording and measuring in, in ocean, uh, I said that we are using hydrophones. They are only sensitive to wave propagation uh, to the pressure, pressure variation. And there are very few uh, sensors that can measure particle motion. So most studies are done with, with uh, hydrophones measuring pressure variation. And then one make, in these studies they do make uh, conclusions on how fish react. And that's usually a kind of a, of, a, of a scientific gap a little bit. So coming now to, to kind of a little bit larger, uh, higher level, now, now we know that, that fish and mammals, they, they use it and it's very valuable information they get from it. But what do they listen to? And, and, and this uh, was already looked upon by, by Southworth in 1969. And he, he started to talk about soundscape. And he took this wording from, from, the, from that time with everybody talking about landscaping. So he took it and, and, and reformed it into soundscape that there are, and, and he did it mainly for, for, for urban soundscape and humans and things like that. So if you close your eyes in a city, for example, there are different kinds of sounds that you will, that you will hear. So this has then been, been uh, taken into the marine uh, environment and, and it describes somehow everything you can hear. Uh, and, and, and usually this is kind of a good, uh, I think, example of that. Uh, and, uh, and if you hear this and close your eyes, you, you, you can imagine, I mean, kind of beautiful blue day, sun is up and, and oh, something happened. I'm sorry for that. And this, this is, this was a show, you know, was of course masking. I mean, that's something anthropogenic source uh, comes into play and disturbs. Uh, and and uh, of course this, this, if you are sitting in the forest and, and really enjoying it. And you can hear an airplane very often, you get a little bit annoyed. So soundscapes is something that, that's been, been, been actually going on for a lot of time. And you can even go into some pages on the web and see that people are collecting this and you can go in and listen to different kinds of soundscapes. And I just took this 
uh, example here that uh, there was recording in, in the Baltic Sea from ice. How does ice sounds like? And, and we don't have, a, as, I mean, the, 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 the understanding of the urban soundscape and, and also the, the, the soundscape of the, uh, of the environment, the, und the undisturbed environment has come much further on, on land and it has come in the aquatic environment. I think that, that one of the reasons is it's easy to, to measure on land, but also it's easy to under, understand the land uh, compared to understanding the aquatic environment, which is so different for us humans. Uh, Pianowski 2013 uh, presented this kind of, of, of diagram showing a little bit what, what is a soundscape. And, Soundscape today is defined like this. It's a natural part, there's a human part, there's a climate part, and, and also there's kind of a static part that we cannot do much in the landscape structure. And they, these, play, they, these interplay together to form the soundscape patterns. And Pianowski actually kind of interesting. Uh, I, see, I heard him in, on, a, on some years ago in, in the conference and he, he had a recording from a, from, a, from a field, from a farming field. I don't remember now, it was 30s or the 40s in the United States. And he put, somebody put a microphone in, inside the field and he revisited this field in 2010 or something like that and did the same kind of recording. And in the, in the earlier recording, you can hear all these insects and birds uh, making sound. I mean, especially insects, hum, humming and whistling and, and everything, uh, and birds that are trying to, to get the, the insects. And in the in the modern, in the new recording, it's silent. There is no 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 insects. There is no birds anymore. So, so th th this is uh, kind of interesting to see how the soundscape has changed, uh, and we know for sure it has been the same in the in the in the aquatic environment. I know that people in, in on land are talking about adaptation, for example, and morphological adaptation to the soundscape, and and that is something we don't see. And the niche effect, I'm sorry, on the niche effect also, and and uh, th this this. Th and I think most of you have heard that that some birds has moved into the to the urban environments have changed their way of singing, and this is because they are optimizing their way of, of transmitting, and they can do that because they are very skillful singers, uh, and that and this is called the niche effect in in some case. And morphological adaptation is of that of course the, the bird DNA is changing uh, quickly because they are adapting, and uh, and that can be done. In, in urban environment because they have such a broad repertoire, the, 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 the birds. So the birds who has the best repertoire will survive. So that is kind of a morphological adaptation. We know that in the ocean, this is not the same. If you take the cod, for example, that they have their swim bladder that can vibrate and that's it. It can vibrate in a certain way. And, and it's, they cannot change that, where they are not very skillful. Uh, and so the morphological adaption will take much longer time. And that also means that it cannot definitely not adapt today their way of, of burping and singing uh, to, the, to the situation, to, to the soundscape, which is influenced by, by human pressure. Okay, so, so, uh, so taking the next step here is that uh, we haven't, I haven't talked anything about, about human involvement and human sources but usually we show this 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 picture here uh, this figure here and on the top here we have some animals that you recognize uh, even if they are in black and on the bottom part we see here that we have like 10 hertz 100 hertz 1 kilohertz 10 kilohertz 100 kilohertz and usually humans we are like down here a little bit we can listen here but it's not important in this case but you can see like eels here, they, have, uh, they can hear very low frequency up to some 100 hertz. And cod can hear a little bit higher, up to 300, 400 kilohertz. I think even they can hear a bit higher. And then there's some fish that go up to one kilohertz. And there comes some kind of seals. And in the Baltic Sea, we have seals. That we know they can hear from some 100, 
hertz. I think they can hear from lower, but studies shows that it's about from 100 hertz up to some 30, 40 kilohertz. We have now the harbor purposes that can hear up to 130 kilohertz. They are very skillful. We're a good listener at 130, but you can still hear at 10 hertz, 100 hertz. And then we had a family of whales also, uh, and we have the big, uh, big kind of Balean whales that can hear from some very, very low up to some 10 kilohertz. And then we have dolphins again also that can hear up to higher hair. So we see a broad range of the animals in, in, in the sea that can hear from super low, some few hertz up to several 10 to 100 kilohertz here. And then we go down to the lower part here in the gray, and we can see the anthropogenic activities and what they are producing, what kind of noise. And there's a lot of anthropogenic noise going on here. And I'm going to especially focus on this part here, which is the piling, and also uh, on, on, uh, on uh, commercial shipping here. But we also have other kind of activities like fishing and trawling, and we also have sonars and a little bit uh, I'm, I'm showing kind of a submarine here, but today we know that there are getting more and more commercially available sonars of different kinds used by civilian authorities and even private companies today. So I think that there's a mixture between uh, military uh, activities and civilian activities when it comes to sonars. But, but what the picture shows here is the frequency ranges, and there is a very, very clear overlap between what they can hear and what we humans are producing. So, so that is kind of a warning flag that, that there might be an effect. It's not a direct evidence of this effect, because if these are not very loud or they're far away, then of course they, 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 that's, that's not a problem. This is a snapping shrimp and it's not, uh, well, I would say that if, if is, is it interesting for the Baltic Sea? I don't think, I'm a little bit sticking my neck out, I don't think we have snapping shrimp yet in, in the Baltic Sea. However, in Scotland, no, no thank you. <laughs> in Scotland, there are, and also I heard that there are on the West Coast starting to get some snapping shrimps, uh, so, uh, but they are probably uh, not, equipped for for the brackish water i think but but uh, on the west coast maybe there are some uh, and definitely in scotland in some bays that have been found this snapping shrimp but it's the loudest producing animal in the world they say even if you compare to land-based because they are producing a cavity uh, of air when they are snapping their their claw which implodes and makes a very, very loud noise. And if you're diving in the Mediterranean, for example, you can all hear them quite often. Okay, let's go to an animal like the cod, for example, that I talked about. And we have cod in the Baltic Sea. And be aware now, if you're gonna just hear one of them. That was the cod. And that kind of sound it makes is very important for the cod because it uses it for two purposes and it uses, his, uses it pro, usually when it mates. And it is one way to tell, other, uh, to tell other males that I'm here, don't come here. And it tells uh, the female that I'm a male, come here. And actually the, the frequency of, of the cod goes down. It has lower uh, producing sound when it gets bigger. So that's all also indicates for the female that this is a big or this is a small cod. And then when, when they are meeting and starting to mate, the, the female and the male, they do a very uh, intricate uh, dancing together. Uh, uh, and then they're doing this kind of mating by synchronizing using the sound. And of course, if they are successful in, in, uh, in putting the eggs, uh, then and that that is related to this this sound synchronization and if there's a big ship nearby, uh, the synchronization is disturbed, and the success rate of, of the egg will go down. So so just showing you that there is uh, very clear like uh, like uh, examples of how they are using it, 
And then a dolphin, uh, this is a bottlenose dolphin, uh, how, how it can sound, because using the harbor purpose is not very, because we can't hear it. Uh, but that, that is quite known to you. So this is sounds from animals. And then we have also sounds from, from, the, from the ocean or from the sea. And uh, the most common sound is waves. And usually when you put the hydrophone into open water, at least, where you don't have a beach near, because this was near to, to kind of a, a beach. But if you put in an open environment, it will more like be a constant hush. Uh, because all of the breaking waves producing bubbles, the bubbles get, get uh, pressed down into the water and implodes and they make a kind of a cracking noise, which has kind of all, almost all frequencies. And as there are so many, many, many uh, bubbles all around, it will be like a kind of a humming all the time in the oceans. So that is present all the time and it's kind of a natural ambient sound. Another one is rain. I'm sorry for that, uh, which is also present and natural and quite high frequency, quite loud. Here is just kind of a more uh, exotic one, uh, thunder. And here is something that is quite common in, in the big oceans. And I will tell you what it is afterwards, if I can start it. That was an earthquake. And it's very low frequency. And low frequencies uh, propagate very, very long distances. So this can be like an earthquake in Chile and it can be recorded in Hawaii, the, the sound. And then something we have in the Baltic Sea that we should not forget, uh, because when we're talking about the member states, it is in principle just, uh, also sticking out my neck a little bit now, but I would say that I have mainly two countries, Finland and Sweden, which has really ice coverage, especially Finland, I would say, but also Estonia has it in some base during winter, but I, I would guess also that it happens in, in Lithuania, these things, but mainly these two countries. And, and when you have ice cover, many people think, oh, it must be very silent then because you don't have any ways, but everybody who has been walking on ice the summer day knows that it, you have it crackling and humming and everything. And then also in, in spring, uh, we know we have this, what is called rotten ice, that, that is partly ice, partly water. I mean, and the waves comes in, it, it, you can hear this kind of friction between eyes, which is really loud also. So these are natural ambient sound. And, and this is a little bit what the soundscape is, is, is about. These are there, and uh, we will never get rid of them. They should be there. This is a way for the, for the fish and the mammals uh, to, to orient. And it's good for them. Uh, uh, I don't know if they, they understand what I'm saying now, but if the waves are producing a lot of sound, then I, if I would be a fish, I would understand that don't go near the surface. It's pretty way way up there. And if it's raining, you, they can understand it's probably raining. I don't know what to do with that, but it's a way to understand their soundscape. And then, of course, we're coming now to the human made noise. And I, I restricted myself now to, to the, these two that I mentioned before, the piling and the shipping. And the reason for, for selecting these two things is because these are the two major human made noise in the Baltic Sea and around the, the European coastline today, I would say. And especially in the North Sea, there is a lot of uh, piling going on. And I would say everywhere in the world, but especially when it gets narrow, like in the Sound or in the English Channel, uh, or in the Baltic Sea, commercial shipping of, is, of course, uh, um, producing a lot of sound. And this is how piling sounds like. Uh, and shipping, 
So this is actually a recording we made in, in a project, the BIAS project that Ida was participating in. I was the coordinator of that. And this one was selected because it was the most musical ship we found. I'll stop it there. Uh, what they have in common, these two, but they are, is that they are loud. That, that is what they have in common. And uh, also what they produce sound in an environment uh, which is very different from, from, the, from the land environment because there is, the sound is produced in the water and the sound cannot escape the water is locked in between the seabed and the sea surface and that is also explained a little bit when you are standing on a, on a jetty and there is a big ship passing by and and may, maybe you thought about it maybe not but why can't you hear any sound from the ocean uh, if you put your ear against the water why can't you hear anything you can just hear it with your ear which is pointing towards the ship and the, and the sound coming through the air. And the reason is that the sound in the water cannot penetrate this, the sea surface. It's like a, almost like a, it is a perfect mirror, especially if you compare it to a, a mirror you have at home. So it's like a mirror just reflecting down the, this, the, the noise. And that also have the effect that noise gets locked in and bounces around. Uh, in, in, the, in the water and, the, and, the dis and, and bounces away and away and away and, 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 and the decrease of the sound levels, attenuation of sound level is very slow. So a ship is, can be easily can be heard, it depends a little bit about where you are and what season it is, but definitely you can hear 10 to 20 kilometers distance and a piling 50 to 100 kilometers, I would say. Uh, something like that. Uh, it, it, you have to be a little bit careful here when, when, you, when you state these things because you can always find cases when it's not that. And you can always find cases when it's even uh, uh, higher uh, ranges in this case. Uh, so when I, we are now starting to get into more details here. And that is the metrics of sound. And, and the only thing, and I have put a lot of metrics to write there, uh, but I, it, the takeaway from this kind of presentation I'm giving here is that there are two major metrics that we talk about. And one is, we call it SPL, we're using that abbreviation, the sound pressure level. And it's given in decibel relative to one micropascal. You don't have to care about micropascal, it's given in decibel. And that is also what air pressure is given in. Uh, in decibel. However, air pressure is not given in decibel relative to one micropascal. So you can't compare air pressure with some pressure in, the, in water. Never do that. Never do that. Like 110 dB on land is very, very high. It's still high in water, but not very, very high. So don't even try to, to make a comparison between that. But some pressure level, that is actually uh, what it says, what is it inst instantaneously right now, uh, the, the sound level. And, uh, uh, and the other metrics is sound exposure level. And that is also the, when you integrate something. Um, I will give you a good example later, but, but uh, that means that, that if you are, okay, I'll give you the example now. You're sitting in a bar and there are, you know, in the evening, they're taking up uh, the volume, they're cranking up the volume, and it doesn't really feel that bad, you know, but you are inside that uh, bar for a long time, so you are integrating the, the, the sound level for one hour, and then that's the sound exposure level. How, how much have you been exposed to in time? The sound pressure level, that is the instantaneous level that they have which is not the same. So uh, taking the, this kind of uh, uh, comparison one step further is that uh, if you're standing behind a jet fighter and they ignite their engine, it will, the, it will be the sound pressure level that kills your ear. Poof, it says immediately, because the sound pressure level is too high for your ear. 
But if you are in a bar, which you feel is not that high, but you are in there for a long time, then it will be the sound exposure level that kills your hearing. And this is exactly the same, same for, for the animals here, that these two metrics has to be um, investigated separately. Uh, and they both can actually inflict uh, effects, uh, negative effects on, on the animals. And I will try to go back uh, also to these two examples. Why do we have these two examples and why do we make a distinguish, distinguish them? And the thing is that the, the piling you see on the left side, this is a hammer that is, uh, it could be like 200 metric tons falling on, on, on a big pile. And, and then of course, as you know, hammering uh, is, is kind of an impulsive noise, a pang, silent, pang, silent. And this kind of noise is very different from this continuous noise that ships, ships are producing. And, and why we distinguish them from each other is because they have different effect on animals usually. And also the, the studies that you are doing is very different. Uh, if you would do a lab study on an animal uh, somehow related to ships, you put the fish or the mammal in, in and then you expose it to this humming all the time, continuous humming. And, and, uh, and then you, you have to, to, it will react in one way. However, if you put the same fish in a lab and, and put a very loud sudden noise, it will react in a different way. So also the studies are, are, are separated when it comes to these kind of, of effects. So that's why we are separating them. Up, like that. Okay, let's go a little bit into details here now. Now, now uh, uh, I talked about uh, sound pressure level. And I have this graph uh, table up here on the upper right side showing source levels. And this is actually sound pressure level, the maximum sound pressure level from different kind of human activities. And you talked about cargo vessels and they can be up to 192 decibel. Here, as you see, and they have a bandwidth, which is also important because like this one, the cargo vessel goes from 40 hertz up to 500 hertz here. So if you have an animal that is more sensitive in higher frequencies, cargo vessels will, will be not be a, a problem. And then also going into the last column here is, is continuous wave. So we have to look in, in the continuous wave domain and, and look at studies doing done on continuous wave. Also, I we should have pile driving, which is now impulsive noise, and, and the maximum sound pressure is 240 uh, decibel. Uh, it's quite high, and 240 de uh, decibel doesn't exist when it comes to sound levels in air, just to remind you. And you see the sound levels here, or the frequency level is 100 to, to 1 kilohertz. You can also look like the loudest events we have, and that is when you have a, a charge, uh, underwater uh, depth charge, for example, underwater explosion. Then you, you have an, a source level of 304 decibel, which is kind of the largest man-made uh, sources we have. Another source which we actually have in the Baltic Sea is air guns. I was a little bit surprised when I was working with this in, in TG Noise on the European level. I thought we're not going to have that much of it in, in, in the Baltic Sea. But when the, 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 the agency started to report about what kind of activities they, they were performing in the Baltic, this came up actually as, as one of the activities. Um, and um, so it, 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 it is existing also. And then we have other ones like sonars. Uh, we have also sub-bottom profilers, which are sonars, and these are used by, by uh, prospecting companies uh, before they are putting down a, a, a cable or a tube on the seabed. Uh, and also we see here something that is starting to get more and more interesting, which I would like also to highlight for you, and that is, is, is leisure boats, uh, outboard engine, and it has been neglected. Uh, very much, at least on European level, uh, maybe for good reasons, but, but it has been in Mekli, definitely also. And th this is the, so you see, there is a, this is broad range and they're producing quite a lot of, 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 uh, of, of sound, high sound levels. Uh, of course, if you, if you go far away, uh, the sound received sound level will go down, but I, but I, but as I told you, the, the attenuation is much weaker than on land. So there are still high levels 
uh, even some kilometers away from these. So it means that it can affect quite a lot of animals, uh, these things, these, these activities. And this is just showing now the, how, how I think it's the same. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's the same recording here that, that how it hap what happens is that you hammer uh, we do a huge, huge hammer on this pile and um, stop it. And it, it, the piling, the, 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 they're piling them down to 30, 40 meters. And they usually pile them for hours. And when they finished the, this pile, they go to the next pile because uh, a wind park consists of hundreds of piles, at least 20 up to 100 of them. So this can go on for months. That means that you, these, these impulsive events, they are, they are in this area going on for a long time, which means that the, the, the animals are, are, are effective for a long time. And what we're showing here is that, that, that there is this kind of wave produced in, in the sound, but there's also waves produced in the seismic, in the, in the sediment that tra travels in the sediment there. So both, both benthic, pelagic, and also bottom living animals are, are, are exposed to sound. One of the things is that they are growing larger and larger, these wind turbines. We, like half a year ago, we talked about six megawatts. That is what uh, Siemens are producing now, which is uh, six times bigger than those we have today in the Baltic Sea. And just some weeks ago, China said they're going to produce a 60 megawatt. And we are talking about a sweep area of 46,000 square meters and a football field is seven thousand square meters we are talking about beasts now you know and i i can't imagine what kind of pilings they're going to have i mean we have to be aware of that and, and you have to be be cautious here now <laughs> so i say i skipped that i also want to say that that there are mitigation measures that there are techniques for 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 attenuating these things. And they are tested and they are not just tested, they are used commercially in the North Sea. You can put bubbles around, you can put curtains around this piling and that actually attenuates quite well the, the, uh, the, the noise uh, from the piling. Quickly then to commercial shipping, uh, commercial shipping. Is this a problem? And there are very few measurements. These are the few measurements that have been done, starting in the 60s and up to 2010. And they are, they are all showing that, yes, the average uh, sound pressure is going up due to shipping. And of course, there are more and more shipping, and the ships get bigger and bigger. So no wonder, I mean, that, 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 the, that the ambient noise from ships are increasing. And th this... Uh, this graph here shows a little bit, uh, it also from the bolt, from the bias project, the green one on the x-axis, you have the sound pressure and, and on the y, the occurrence. And if you skip and take away all ships in the Baltic, you get the green distribution. And then you put the ship traffic in, you get the blue distribution. And you see there's a very clear shift of how the soundscape looks like. So the sounds get, get on average on monthly scale much louder because of the ships producing this humming that is always there. So there's a shift from a natural condition to a disturbed condition. And I won't show this, this is Helcom. Uh, I just wanna show you that we have done this BIOX project and, and recording. So we have a pretty good understanding of what, what is the, the effect what is the pre exposure from the shipping. And we can say that everywhere in the Baltic Sea, there is uh, sound from the ships. And this is from the BIAS project. And this is now a little bit subtile, subtle, but, but, we, but it's 125 Hertz. And we're looking at the 10% highest, loudest events. And you can see in some parts down here and in the main shipping lane, we're reaching a received level of 120 dB, which is pretty high, actually. I mean, ships are producing quite high. These are the median values in the, in the ocean, and it's done by Chom Institute in France. And you can see the white areas here, stretching around here and even go in here. So the median is up to 120 dB, 110 to 120 dB. And this is a little bit surprised. It's, it's high. I, I, I wouldn't expect it's, it's that high, actually. 
uh, uh, from the ships on, 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 on average. And this is kind of a warning flag that we should definitely not neglect it. I have like three more slides now. Uh, so bear with me or, or, or stay at least. And I want to come into European Union and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And just showing that uh, there are like three important documents. Is the directive, is the decision which is very important, and is this staff working document that was released 2020 that tried to, to handle it. And in this document is this decryptor 11 that says that we have to manage and handle, understand impulsive noise and continuous noise. And they are, all, of course, then under, divided into handling of impulsive in one way and, and uh, continuous in another way. And the big challenge is to actually overbridge uh, uh, three areas here, because when we talk to start, about, start talking about sources and wave propagation, we are talking about acoustics. And when, we, and when we talk about the animals, we're talking about biology, but we have to produce an end product in Europe that is actually read by managers, by the management. So we have time to, to clean wash uh, ourselves into a language which ends up with what is interesting by the managers here. And this has been a very, very, very interesting challenge. So making a summary of the, of the decision directive is that it's, today is a risk-based indicator, which is very good. That came with the decision 2017. It's also based on habitat, which we think is very good because habitat is directly linked to the species. And it's a good way of actually uh, evaluating the effect. Uh, to take species distribution is, is, is very difficult usually, and, and there is not much data on that. Habitat is better. This also includes a reference condition. And, and that is what I showed you with the green, green graph. That is, if you don't have any, or nearly not to have any, any ships or, or, or impulsive noise, what, would, what is that? And how much can we accept in, in uh, how much how large deviation from that can we accept? It also states that we that we have to define a good environmental status as affected area in percentage. How large area, how large percentage of the habitat is affected for this indicator species? We have also to take into account other directives. And we also have to have a regional adaptation. And that's where HELCOM and OSPAR and also the Barcelona Convention comes into place. I skipped these things and, and uh, actually show that, that uh, go to my conclusions. And I also know there's a hand raised. Uh, and this is very much my personal conclusions. It's not the chair of the TG noise, but I would say there is compelling evidence now that noise affects animals. Uh, these effects might lead to negative effects on population dynamics, which is important. I haven't mentioned this uh, up to now. Uh, individual and in, individual cod may be not that important, but, but the population of cod is important. Irrespective of knowledge gap, noise must be managed and regulated. That means that you can identify, there's a big gap between, we know how individual mammal or individual cod reacts but what is the effect on population level? And there is no really scientific studies of it, uh, but we, we have to overbridge this uh, and, and come up with some kind of, of, goods, of good solution there. And I will also say that European Union working hard to make D11 operation as quick as possible to the next implementation cycles, which I think is 2023 or four now, they want to have this working actually. And I would also state there is resistance partly from member states and actually from scientists, I would say also, which is a little bit interesting, I think. Uh, and then I know talking to managers that they are standing on their knees and say, just deliver something that we can use, uh, which is pragmatic. And then uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, they say to us, to, to the chairs. It, uh, we can improve it on the way. So I think that's, where I would like to ask you uh, to come in to, to keep the pressure uh, up. Uh, and, I think, uh, and I think that it's very important that you are involved in, in the regional conventions. Uh, I think that the work there is interesting, but to me, a little bit slow sometimes. 
my personal uh, and also keep the pressure in, in uh, against TG noise, of course, uh, because we have uh, member states inside that is somehow uh, uh, challenging to, to deal with, I would say there. So thank you very much for your attention.